So y'all don't like Doki Doki Precure, huh? That's weird. Me, on the other hand, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's got problems, sure, but it's far from the worst. This season has great pacing and a refreshing sense of forward momentum. Its characters are super fun for how exaggerated they are, even if they could use some more fleshing out. I also dug the thematic exploration of selfishness and how that tied into the villains. I know this season isn't liked by or even for everyone, but you know what I think? First off, Doki Doki is the best paced season of Precure. This show has a constant sense of forward momentum, and even the few episodes that aren't actively driving the story forward are either doing some decent world building, or fleshing out the characters, or otherwise doing something to give the sense that something has changed by the end of the episode. Most previous seasons relied on having a status quo to return to so that every episode didn't have to worry about what came before and could just be its own thing. While this season does eventually establish a status quo, which, mind you, takes about a whole core to set in, it's rarely relied upon too long before something gets shaken up. Let's look at some particulars. The opening of the first episode works to immediately establish the world story in new quick pace, whereas the previous season's smile just sort of opened with the main character going to school. This one opens with action. We get a nice shot of a kingdom quickly falling into ruin. I love the simplicity of the transition, going from the calm blues and whites to the harsh and muddied oranges and browns quickly and effectively communicates that shit has gone down, all with just a few frames. Incidentally, we find out later that this kingdom, whose salvation is one of the character's primary motivators, is called... Oh, oh dear, it's a... Uh, <laughs> it's called Trump Kingdom. As in, wow, look at the ruins of Trump Kingdom. This 2013 show really prophesized what America would turn into. So just from the cold open, we're already on the edge of our seats, and though the momentum will slow from there, as it should to let us catch our breath, it never stops. The rest of the first episode wastes no time introducing, or at least teasing, most of the main characters. From there, the first couple of episodes focus on Mana and her relationship with Rika, while the following episodes flesh out Rika, Alice, and Makoto respectively. Standard fare so far for each episode to focus on a different character, though I really appreciate how episode 2 focused on Rika's relationship with Mana and held off on making her a cure until the next episode. But those episodes do more than just focus on a character, they set up long-term mysteries, flesh out histories, and leave cliffhangers dangling for the next episode. And once all the main characters are together, the action doesn't stop there. Just as soon as the main cast are all united, instead of spending several episodes in slice-of-life mode as other seasons would definitely do, they're all immediately stolen away to Trump Kingdom in a cliffhanger, the resolution to which sees us learning more about the world and establishing strong motivations and goals going forward. I could go on, but you get the idea. Once Doki Doki steps on the gas, it rarely lets up. And I deeply appreciated this season's newfound forward momentum because it made this season much more digestible. The constantly evolving nature of the world and characters kept me continuously intrigued. Curious to know what would happen or change next, I was more tempted to keep watching, to drop everything in favor of drooling in front of my screen while pretty cartoon lights flashed into my eyes. <laughs> to be clear, this season isn't always blazing forward lightning fast. There are some slower episodes that aren't as connected with the overall happenings and are more about hanging with the characters, echoing the pacing and structure of previous seasons. These less connected episodes aren't inherently a bad thing, hell, a few would make a welcome change of pace to let things cool off after any particular stretch of connected episodes. Unfortunately, there's one particular set of filler-feeling episodes later on that weren't just slow but really dull, and we'll get back to those later. Generally, though, the other slow episodes act as a nice change of pace in the midst of this new format. Now, I must acknowledge that this new storytelling structure is a severe break from the norm for Precure. Every prior season in comparison to this one has been relatively slow-paced. Given their heavy reliance on slice-of-life stories and 
brief Monster of the Week brawls, past seasons were content to let most episodes stand on their own. Doki Doki's approach of connecting episodes and quickening the pace is decidedly different, but I must stress that different does not mean bad. For some, this break of style just might not be what you're looking for from Precure, and that's fine. But me, I love it when formulas are discarded, the status quo challenged. I liked this new approach specifically because it wasn't normal for Precure, and I was excited to see what new directions the show could go in. I think overall, with the exception of some clunkers in the later half, this season's new approach to pacing and story structure paid off both in distinguishing this season from past ones and in keeping things fun. For now though, a well-connected story crafted to keep you coming back would mean nothing if the characters featured therein didn't grab you, so let's talk about them. Our lead this time is another enthusiastic pink-haired gal, Mana Ida. Of all the Precure protagonists who fit that description, Mana is the most exaggerated. I mean, I thought Miyuki was a little hyperbolic in her characterization, but Mana just takes her everything up to 11. These go to 11. Mana is her school student council president, and she's wholly dedicated to helping others. I mean it. When someone asks for help, she'll stop at nothing to help them. Indeed, if Mana has one glaring character flaw, it's that she's so blindly dedicated to helping others that she doesn't know when to quit. She will literally work until she faints, and then try to jump out of bed and get back to work when she wakes up, because who needs sleep, am I right? <coughs> she works so hard that she puts her own health at risk. This over-the-top dedication to helping others would be comedic if it wasn't also a little scary. I find Mana to be endearing for her dedication and enthusiasm for helping others, though her goal of being prime minister one day may be a bit naive given the state of women in Japanese politics. Her sheer helpfulness is something that literally anyone would do good to emulate. Her overzealousness can also act as a cautionary tale. It's good to look after others, but be sure to take care of yourself. After all, the healthier you keep yourself, the more you're able to put yourself out there and help others or do whatever. I also appreciated the little moments that showed that Mana wasn't just a mindless paragon of good. Though to be honest, you could make a fair argument for that being the case if you really wanted to. There's this moment in episode 31 where hope seems lost and Mana just cries. Her being the hero, of course she recovers eventually, and Mana being Mana, she does it with a breathtaking <laughs> But that she cried at all and for the length of time that she did showed that she has a very fallible and human side. What makes her a hero isn't that she's always happy, always right and good, always winning. Rather, she recognizes that sometimes things are just shit that you can't help, and all you can do in those situations is buckle up and power through it anyway. Bravery in the face of danger. Go, girl. Her best friend is Rika Hishikawa and I absolutely love their friendship. One thing I found really lacking in the previous season's smile was a strong dynamic between any two of the characters. They all worked great as a group, but no single relationship was ever given any real focus. Rika and Mana, though, have wonderful chemistry. Rika often acts as the straight woman to Mana's everything, and Rika is always looking out for her and trying to reel in Mana, who can get in way over her head. Given their numerous shared scenes and history, it's hard to not get a sense of the deep bond these two share. Given all that, I would honestly argue that these two have a stronger, more fleshed out bond than any other pair of characters throughout the entire franchise thus far. Hell, even the show acknowledges this. It, that's, that's, that's weird right there. Put a pin in that. Uh, anyway, this strong friendship and everything the show does to flesh it out comprise this show's emotional core. Get behind these two and they'll take you far. But for Rika herself, balancing out Mana's everything and the various eccentricities of the later members, Rika is the group's voice of reason. Like Mana, she's a caring individual, to the point that her dream is to become a doctor one day. In keeping with that goal, she's much less outgoing and much more about personal care. 
While Mana will strive to help everyone at everything, Rika focuses on the task at hand and tries to help one person as fully as possible. <laughs> that person usually being Mana. Her ability to focus on a task and personalize her care are very befitting a future doctor, though she's not afraid to be stern when the situation calls for it. My favorite Rika bit was in episode 14, where she went to do a little soul searching. Her life goal up until that point had been to be a doctor, and we learned the reason behind it. That her mother's a doctor, and she greatly admires her. Fair enough, but now, Rika starts to question whether she really wants that for herself. She only ever wanted it because her mother was doing it. How does she know she'll really like it? So she goes on a soul-searching quest that spans several episodes, and she starts out by getting into Karuta. Alright, to be honest, I'm only really mentioning this because up until recently, I hadn't the faintest idea what Karuta was, and then I started watching Chihaya Furu, so then I did know, and then just as soon as that happened, this episode came on and I was like, holy shit, Karuta, I know what that is. It was bizarre that this obscure sport that I'd never heard of or seen before came up in Precure as soon as I started watching a show about it. Look, if you take anything from this video, watch Chihaya Furu, it's good, I promise. Anyway, Rika starts trying out different things, starting with Karuta, and initially hides it from her mother for fear of disappointing her, only for her mother to find out and be a supportive saint. Mom of the year right there. Rika learns that it's okay to pursue your passions even if they won't lead to careers. They're vital for your happiness and can be useful besides. It's okay to take your time to find out who you want to be. And if in the meantime you find something you love, more power to you. Pursue your passions, kids. Then we have Alice Yotsuba, who despite being the most outwardly calm and reserved, is the most hilarious character this season due to pretty much everything else about her. For one, she's the rich heiress to a multinational conglomerate, and her massive wealth enables her to do literally anything the plot calls for, like scientifically analyze a magic doohickey on a giant screen, or cover up all evidence of the Precure and their magic fights by erasing security cam footage and bribing witnesses into silence, or speed off in a Precure mobile, or fly into space on her own personal jet. She, she's the fucking Batman Precure, you, you know I'm right. The part that really drives home the hilarity of Alice's being, though, is her backstory and how it informs our perception of her personality. Though she has the outward appearance of being weak and reserved, she actually used to be the victim of bullying, but only because she allowed it. Once it went too far, she unleashed her inner demon and beat the ever-loving shit out of a guy three times her size, it was hilarious. Alice hides within her immeasurable strength, but chooses to keep it in reserve and only use it to help others. With great power comes Griyada Yada, I know her whole deal is about not letting bullies get the best of you. If one has power, one should not use it selfishly, but rather for the benefit of all, I get it, but Everything about how Alice is presented is just so over the top, which I guess is consistent with how Mana is presented. She's not just rich, she's so rich that she can make the wildest things happen for the sake of plot convenience. She's not just strong, she's not just secretly strong, no. Her secret strength is so vast that if her magic precure power wasn't a shield, but instead some kind of offensive thing, like a laser beam, then she could probably one-hit KO the big bad. And I love all of that. Her exaggerated presentation, coupled with her usual calm demeanor, make her a joy to have on screen. She may not be the most relatable character in the world, but I'll be damned if she didn't put a smile on my face. On pretty much the opposite end of the spectrum from Alice Yotsuba is Makoto Kenzaki. Where just about everything about Alice is hyperbolized to an amusing degree, Makoto is played deathly straight. She's probably got the coolest backstory of any cure in the series, which in turn makes for the strongest character motivation in the series thus far. She's the last, actually one of two, surviving warriors of a fallen kingdom, and she's sworn to do everything in her power to defeat those who destroyed her home and return it to its former glory. This girl's entire world was taken from her, and she fights every day to get it back, showing a strength of will shared by few others. Makoto has more reason than anyone to give up and despair, but she doesn't. Instead, she turns all her hardships into strengths. What doesn't kill you make you stronger, and she survived a lot. Makoto turned her loss into her reason for fighting. She can't lose that much ever again, nor will she let anyone else. 
Makoto's all about persevering through the hard times, and all the various good and bad ways to go about that. She starts out cold and pushes away the other cures. She doesn't want to get to know them, only to lose them, like she did her kingdom. Of course, she eventually opens up because, as the old saying goes, it's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. Getting to know her new friends was always going to be worth it for the wonderful memories they made together, even if they were always going to be in danger. By accepting the reality of her situation, Makoto was able to make the most of it, live in the moment, and that's something we should all strive to do. <laughs> There's one thing about Makoto I should mention though. She's also an idol. I don't know what I expected. If you've been around a while, you probably know my feelings on idols, but just in case, the long and short of it is I think the whole idol industry is kind of creepy, dehumanizing, and fetishistic. So when I see a child character being an idol and more or less glorifying the profession, well, that's just all sorts of weird. I I'm not here to linger on that, just wanted to make sure you had that context. So within this season, the whole idol thing is an outlet for Makoto's love of singing, a means of self-expression, okay. But not always. At first, the gig was simply a means to an end, a way to make herself visible and get a message to a lost friend, an understandable and practical motivation. As soon as that motivation no longer applies, though, Makoto's whole reason for being an idol disappears, and this is where shit gets a little weird. Since that motivation has disappeared, Makoto decides to step down from being an idol and makes it clear that she's not sure she wants to continue doing it and that she needs time to figure things out for herself. Alright, on board so far. But then... Her friends pressure her into staying on as an idol. Oh boy. Makoto made it clear that she wasn't sure she wanted to do it, and yet that concern never seemed to give her friends pause. Instead, all they repeat, and I mean repeat, is that she should keep doing it because they want her to. They like her singing, so she should keep doing it for them, regardless of whether or not she wants to. It's not about what others want, it's about what she wants. That should be your primary concern, but instead you swing back too. I Fucking kidding me. Though I am sure this portrayal of peer pressure was unintentional, I cannot fathom what the intent actually was, because in execution the main characters that weren't Makoto came off as selfish, entitled asshats who prioritized their fleeting desires over the genuine confusion and soul-searching of a friend in need. This bizarre selfishness is hugely ironic, which we'll get more into later, but more importantly, all I'm left wondering is what the hell was the point of this? What's the message being sent here? It's okay to pressure your friends into doing something they don't want as long as you really want it? I feel like there's potential in here for a discussion of the dangers of peer pressure and how it can lead people into doing things they might not want to do or would otherwise never do, but instead the peer pressure just happens and is written off as an okay thing to have happened. Again, what the fuck? To be clear, Makoto later on states that she does like singing and does like being an idol, but that's not the point. Her friend spent the whole episode pressuring her without that knowledge. Her decision to keep singing, keep being an idol, should have been hers alone based on her own desire to sing, the happiness it brings her. And instead of letting that happen, her friends made it about everyone but her. To try to lighten things up a bit, the whole idol thing wasn't all bad. It was put to excellent use in episode 40, where a whole action set piece was built around Makoto singing.
That scene goes big in its emotional appeal and is definitely the best use of an insert song in this whole series. Makoto is a fun character and she has a lot of great moments, even a couple of epic ones like that. For how long I complained about it, the one peer pressure thing was just one episode out of 49, but it left such an impression that it colored my perception of Makoto after it happened. I still enjoy her character, but I really regret that that one thing happened. On a less depressing note, we have the last of the main five, Aguri Madoka. She, to be honest, she feels more like a plot device than a character. The most important and notable things about her end up being some late game plot revelations, and as such, up until that point, her character is fairly underdeveloped. Being who she ends up being, she serves mostly as a facilitator of other characters' growth or of other plot progression. None of this is helped along by the fact that she only appears halfway through the show, so between everything else that goes on, there was surprisingly little time dedicated to fleshing her out. Honestly, her evil counterpart, who we'll get to later, had much more going on despite having about the same, if not less, overall screen time, and that's just sad. To be clear, I'm not saying Aguri doesn't have anything of note going on, just relatively little compared to the rest of the cast. Being basically a new human with just an adoptive grandmother for a family, she has a lot to learn about love and friendship. She fears connecting with her classmates until she's given a nudge in the right direction, and she fears getting her grandmother caught up in the whole precure thing and tries to push her away, and has to learn to accept that loved ones will be by her side no matter what. There's some good stuff there, just not enough to make her stand out from any other cast member in the whole series. One of the good things about her, though, is something that's more or less applicable to all of the characters. Strong motivations and goals. This season, some of the characters have motivations and goals that drive the story forward and even those that don't usually contribute to maintaining that forward momentum. This stands in contrast to previous seasons where being pre-cure was at best a secondary concern in the lives of otherwise busy characters who only donned their fighting gear when the baddies or season finales rolled around. Though you can make the argument that that's also the case here, it's marked less so. While there are still slice-of-life moments throughout, more often the characters have goals that drive them forward and create connecting through lines across many episodes. To get back to Agari for a moment, being unaware of who she is for a while, she's on a continual journey of self-discovery up until the finale. Her hazy memory will take the cast to new locations, and her eventual discovery of her identity is the whole driving force behind the emotional turmoil of the finale. Makoto, as well, has strong motivations that drive the story forward. She's constantly taking actions to get closer to her goal, as opposed to simply going to school and waiting for the baddies to show up. She's putting on performances and going out at night to search for her lost friend. In other words, this season's forward momentum is aided by everyone being an active agent. All that being said, though, I do have one gripe that applies to all these characters that I'm unsure of the importance of. That gripe is that all of the main characters are important. Well, of course they're important, they're the main characters, but I mean, within their own world, they're important even before the whole Precure thing. Mana is student council president. Alice is the rich heir to a multinational conglomerate. Makoto is a famous idol and the last surviving warrior of a desolate kingdom. Rika is the most normal one of the bunch, but even she has found herself surrounded by a bunch of people high up on the social totem pole. All of these girls were already special within their own lives. This raises the question, why did they in particular need to become cures? This was almost never the case in past seasons. Even when it was, the primary protagonist was always always relatively normal to compensate. Nagisa, Honoka, Saki, and Mai were all pretty much normal students with various academic strengths and weaknesses. Karen may have been student council president, but she was the last to join her group. Meanwhile, the main character of that group, Nozomi, was a pretty average, excitable girl with probably below average test scores, let's be honest. All of these characters, along with the rest, were just fairly average girls with their own quirks that probably a fair number of the target audience could project onto or at least easily relate to. They didn't have to be special to use magic and fight evil. They were 
normal and did it anyway because it was the right thing to do. Not so much in Doki Doki. Here, the already special people get to do even specialer things, and the normal folk are left on the sidelines. Instead of anyone having the heart and courage to save the world, no, you had to already be a hardworking student council president, rich girl, warrior from another world in order to do that. While Precure has usually excelled at having relatable every girls take up the superhero mantle, sending the message that anyone, even you, could be the hero, now it's like this season's telling you to not even bother if you're not already rich or famous or whatever. You can't be better than you are. Only the already powerful can accumulate more power for themselves. By making all the main characters already special, they become less relatable to the target audience and less able to communicate themes of inclusivity and cooperation. After all, if only special people can be superheroes, why bother trying to be super yourself? Used to be all you needed was a good heart to affect positive change. Now, this show says you'd need to be already privileged. While I doubt any of this was intentional on the creator's part, it still bugs me. Keep in mind that I'm not saying characters can't be air quotes special before the pre-cure thing happens. They absolutely can and have been. We've had powerful villains turned good guys and idols and models and a student council president and an insurmountably badass previous generation warrior, but they were all balanced out with companions that led relatively normal lives. Normal and not so normal people worked together to save the world, reinforcing the spirit of cooperation. And that's what we could have used more of here. Tone down all the characters being abnormally special all the time, bring them down to earth and act like normal teenagers. That's all we needed and didn't get. But anyway, that's the main cast of Doki Doki. As always, I did get plenty of fun times out of them, though I have my issues with how special they all are. Their exaggerated presentations and strong motivations always kept me engaged. They're a strong cast, just maybe not as strong as usual. Now that we have a thorough understanding of these characters, let's talk about this season's theme. Selfishness is the name of the game this time. Almost literally, the monsters of the week are actually called selfishes, which is a syllable away from shellfishes. Selfish, shellfishes. Say that five times fast. Selfish, shellfishes, selfish, selfishes, self, shell. Uh, nope didn't happen. Selfishness is generally frowned upon across most societies. After all, accomplishing something at the expense of others, that is selfishly, is rarely as gratifying as the inverse. This season's main character is a figurehead for selflessness, and many of the conflicts are centered on various types of selfishness, with attention paid to how they form and how they can be resolved. All the weekly monsters are born from some selfish desire, whether it be some guy wanting to skip a long line or some girl who wants to be more popular than another. It's important to note that all of these selfish desires are only brief moments of weakness, and that the people who have them usually talk themselves down. This is an acknowledgement that selfishness and the potential to act on those feelings exist in all of us. But most people also have enough common decency that those feelings would likely have disappeared on their own if the villains hadn't shown up to exploit them. Selfishness is also at the forefront of some of the main character's episodic drama, and at the the heart of everything about the big bad. We'll get to him later, but for now let's talk about some of the selfish filler drama, which is where I think the show made a bit of a misstep. For one, there's that whole bit about Makoto's friends pressuring her, which was an unusually selfish and boneheaded act on their part. More importantly, there's a particular set of episodes in the latter half of the show, which I like to call, We're All Mothers Now, in which the characters all try to be good moms to a baby. I hate these episodes. Each of these episodes is about one of the main characters being selfish about something and having that selfishness rub off on the baby. The characters have to correct their own behaviors to set a good example for the baby and teach a lesson in selflessness in the process. In that sense, all of these episodes are thematically on point. Only two problems here. One, I rarely buy into the particular selfish quirks or the drama they create. Like, at best, Makoto being nervous at the dentist is relatable. I mean, that's that's some scary shit right there. You'll be a dentist. Be a dentist. You have a talent for causing things. Hey, hey. Yeah, buddy, eat us. But then you have shit like Aguri doesn't want to eat her vegetables. <sighs> Could you possibly name a more tired, played-out trope of kids' television than 
Ew, vegetables. The second and more important problem is that these episodes grind the pacing to a halt in service of stories that neither drive the plot forward nor are particularly interesting on their own. Up until this point, this season's forward momentum has been one of its greatest strengths, so to ditch that in favor of such riveting stories like side character you don't care about has an unrequited crush is a slap in the face to dedicated viewers. But that one arc is really the only time I was ever truly bored with this season. Otherwise, I was always engaged, and it's telling that the one bad arc was at least thematically consistent with the rest of the season. At the end of the day, everything's about overcoming selfishness and being a better person for it. Mana's all about helping others, Rika wants to heal others, Alice wants to uh, uh, not unleash her hidden infinite rage on others, Makoto wants to save others, and Aguri, well, in order to mention how Aguri ties into selfishness, we're first going to have to discuss... Specifically, we're going to have to discuss the big bad King Selfish and Regina, the latter of which, well, she's amazing. Let's talk about her first, I promise we'll circle back to Agari eventually briefly. Regina acts as a subversion of the sixth ranger trope, which I must acknowledge that a commenter pointed out after the last video. Sixth rangers, named for an occurrence in that old Toksats show from which Precure is partially descended, basically refers to a late game addition to the team. Precure has commonly pulled this by having villains hang out with the main characters until they join forces. Regina, from when she's introduced, follows all the necessary steps to also do that. She's introduced as the daughter of King Selfish, and certainly acts like it for her first few episodes. Throughout her time in the first half, Regina grows by learning the value of selflessness through her friends. She's initially all about her wants, about wanting to keep mana for herself and do whatever sparks her fancy. But eventually, she opens up, learns that acting for and with others namely the other main characters, can also be fulfilling. She's on track to join the team in the mid-season finale when suddenly she's brainwashed by her dad and spirited away until the end of the season. And Agari shows up literally out of nowhere and is like, hi, I'm, I'm the actual sixth ranger. And I'm like, okay, you got me. I didn't really see that one coming. So Regina was on the verge of becoming a selfless friend to the group when she was overtaken by the selfishness of King Selfish. And what does his selfishness entail? Put simply, love. It's important to remember that up until this point all of the monsters have been born from the baddies corrupting the hearts of otherwise good people. They exploited the quickest, faintest moments of selfishness in order to create something monstrous. So King Selfish is that, but even bigger this time. He's actually the old king of Trump Kingdom, whose daughter was dying and the only way to save her was by taking hold of some ancient knowledge, but by doing that he would unleash an ancient evil that would bring his entire kingdom to ruin. Now there's the classic moral conundrum there, the needs of the many versus the needs of the few. The one. His daughter is saved for that moment, but then the ancient evil takes him over and he becomes the big bad and destroys everything. By choosing to prioritize saving one life over ensuring the well-being of all, he accidentally ensured that everyone was doomed. King Selfish made the selfish decision. And to be clear, I'm not faulting him for that. It was an impossible choice, and suffering would have resulted no matter what he did. But because he made a selfish choice, with the greatest of ramifications, saving one while putting countless others in peril, the ancient evil was able to exploit the guilt that doubtless swelled in him because of that choice, so that ruin was brought to all anyway. The great irony here is that his daughter, as he knew her, didn't get to survive anyway. She lives on in some form, but who she was is lost forever, just as she would have been if the king had prioritized his kingdom and its people in the first place. So from a logical, utilitarian perspective, uh, since he lost both his daughter and his kingdom instead of just his daughter, the king made the wrong choice. But that doesn't make him an evil person. After all, to be selfish isn't necessarily to be evil. We all have a little selfishness in us. That's just human nature. And sometimes it can get the better of us. Love can make us do stupid, selfish things. And the king only wanted to protect what he loved. He's not and never was evil for loving his daughter. Only unfortunate in that he was forced to make an impossible choice and had his desires turned against him. 
Ultimately, though, the love that drove him to make that choice is what saved the day. As it turns out in the final major plot twist of the show, the king's daughter split her heart in two so she wouldn't be turned into a monster, and those two halves became Regina and Aguri. They represented two parts of the princess, her innate selfishness and her innate goodness. When those two parts come together, they're able to save their father not by fighting him, but by returning the love that once saved his daughter. Aguri's selflessness and Regina's selfish love are brought together to save the king. The love and selfishness often intersect, and when we learn to embrace and control those feelings and bring them together, we bring out the best in ourselves. Something more than the sum of those parts. At some point, we'll all be selfish and make boneheaded decisions, and it's important to recognize that that doesn't make us bad people. Merely human. The king is saved when he is forgiven for his selfish actions. No one condemns him for it, and his daughters love him regardless. We're all going to be selfish at one point, but as long as we can forgive, we can still love. Accept that you and your loved ones will sometimes make silly, selfish mistakes. Learn how to move forward, and be better for it. And now a bunch of minor stuff before wrapping up. This season had a very refreshing soundtrack. Just by listening to it, I could tell we had a new composer. The past few seasons all had music composed by Yasuharu Takanashi, and while he's a good composer, his compositions for the series started to sound samey after a few seasons. Not to mention, those previous seasons had a habit of recycling tracks from previous seasons. Whether that was Takanashi's choice or not, I don't know. In any case, those two problems were relieved when the new composer, Hiroshi Takaki, came on board for Doki Doki. His soundtrack has a grandiose sort of symphonic flair to it. I enjoy the blaring horns whenever the baddies make a monster. <coughs> and there's this orchestral cover of the opening theme that fits in pretty nicely. Between the new tracks and lack of recycled material, this new composer did a smashing job for his first time at bat. And then there's... <sighs> Look, I, I didn't want to mention this. I don't care to talk about this in general, and I only brought it up as a light gag last time, but a lot of the commenters on the last video got all excited, and now I feel obligated to, so here we go. This season does some very awkward shipping stuff. Baiting. Uh... So, like, back to that pinned bit from earlier, episode 10 opens with this. And then later in that same episode, while Mana and Makoto are caring for the baby, And I'm just like, why? Why is this here? There's never any serious consideration that these characters could be romantically involved, and yet it's heavily teased regardless. And why bother with that teasing if there was never ever going to be any remote chance of that actually being a thing? Like in Smile, it was fun for being one-off visual gags, but here it's more like a whole episode of Rika being jealous of Makoto spending time with Mana after the insinuation that they might make for good spouses, but after this episode, the possibility of them being more than friends is never brought up again, so like, why bother in the first place? And I'm stopping now. We're in the end game now. So that, all finally, is Doki Doki Precure. I enjoyed it. And I know that's somehow a controversial statement, but it's true. Sure, it's got flaws aplenty, it's got one of the weaker main casts in the series, and can be inconsistent with its pacing. But I liked it. Flaws and all. The faster pace and less episodic structure were refreshing to me, even if the show wasn't consistent about it. I loved the characters and all their hyperbole even if they could have done with a little more fleshing out. The consistent exploration of selfishness, both during the episodic monster brawls and among the main villains, was great. I, I get that this season isn't for everyone, that's fine, but as for me, god damn it, this is Precure, and I couldn't help but have a grand old time. Worst season? Hell no, bitches. This show was... Thanks for sticking through to the end. Hey, remember the viewer's choice thing from the end of the last video, the one where you, yes, maybe you, pick what I watch and make a video about? Uh, the first one of those happened successfully, a video about my Hime, 
and you can still get in on this action. The next viewer's choice has been selected, and it's Alien 9. I'll be uploading a video on that soon, so stay tuned for that so you can comment on it and make me watch something, but actually, you know, watch the video too. Thanks again for sitting through my ramblings about a children's cartoon magic show. I don't need to tell you to leave your thoughts in the comments if you have them, but here I am saying it anyway. I hope you'll stick around for the next one. Until then, enjoy cartoons or something.